Revelation tonight. And chapter 2 this evening. Without looking at your Bible, what was the first church of the seven churches? Ephesus. Ephesus. All right, Rich, what was it? That's right, Ephesus. All right. It was Ephesus. And uh, they were known for their uh, labor and uh, for working. And uh, he said he knew that. But he had one thing against them that, that is a, a, a thing that ought to be a warning to all of us is that they had left their first love. They had left their first love. A, a word of condemnation. There was a commendation to be sure, but a condemnation that they had left their first love. The church at Ephesus, City, Ephesus at one time was a going, growing church. Um, you'll remember uh, Paul wrote a letter to them, the church uh, uh, of the Ephesians. It was their tradition says, how much we can go by. That is where the Apostle John wound up with the mother of Christ, the mother of the Lord Jesus, there at Ephesus. Eventually, Timothy became the pastor there for a short while, and it was a going, vibrant church. One of the, not all the books in the New Testament are great. I shouldn't say that one of the books. But the book of, of Ephesians, what a great book that is when it talks about the wealth of the believer and the walk of the believer. And so it was a growing church, even in the midst of idolatry, because it was there that they believed that a, a statue, a meteor fell from heaven, which they said had the shape, the form of Diana. And that's who they worshiped there. You'll remember there was a riot there when Paul was there. But the church at Ephesus was a great church. But they left their first love. Uh, uh, ask me more, John. I'm not sure what you mean. What do you mean by what do I mean? I'm not. What was their first love? Christ. They had become so busy doing for Christ. And it's like this. What does God, what does God want from you and I? Fellowship. Fellowship. So what, that's why, I you know, we often wonder, what is heaven going to be like? I believe it's going to be a great deal like what the Garden of Eden was when God created Adam and Eve to fellowship with him. I realize that we'll, we will be in heaven, in the, the heavenly city, but he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth where we'll serve him and fellowship with him. That's what God wants from us. And to answer John's question was, they had, they had lost their fellowship with him. They were so busy working for him, and he commended them for that. They were a great working church. They were so busy working for him, they forgot to have time with him. And, and that's we need to be careful about that. That's what God wants from us. I know that, you know, John has bukus of money, but God does. Yeah, I know John just gave me that look, but it's like, God doesn't need John's money. God doesn't need my money. What does God want? God wants, what did we sing? Give me thy heart. Give me thy heart. Hear the soft whisper as he calls thee apart. From this old world, he will call thee apart. Calling so tenderly, give me thy heart. So we get to the second church tonight. The second church is Smyrna. And Smyrna was about 45 miles to the northeast in Asia. If you were going to the next big city, if you left Ephesus going to the north, you would go to Smyrna. Now, Smyrna was, again, a big trade city. Notice, let's read this in verse 8, but let's pray, shall we, before we get really going. Father, we thank you again now for the opportunity one more time to look into your word. And Lord, we... I don't think we try to hide the fact that, Lord, we believe that this book is the Word of God. I know, I think all of us know, that is thy minority position today. That 
Yes, Lord, there are a lot of people who believe the King James Bible is the Word of God, but there are a whole lot more people who don't. And so we hold that minority position, but Lord, that doesn't matter. Joshua and Caleb were in the minority, but they were right. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. Again, I ask, Lord, as we open it, give us insight, give us instruction. Lord, I pray that you'll help us as we again try to rightly divide the word of truth. Someone told me the other day the, the book of Revelation is so difficult to understand. Lord, I, I really believe that we can understand it. Lord, help us to do that even tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me just say this quickly. I believe that the only real way to understand the book of Revelation is to interpret it literally. That I, I understand there are similes. A simile is, I saw as it were, or I saw uh, a mount, like as, as it were, a mountain. Okay, it, it's a, a ball of fire falling from heaven, as it were, like unto. All right, so I understand that there are, there are many, there are a lot of similes. I understand that there are a lot of symbols that we read in the book of Revelation, but where we can make common sense of it literally, that is the only way I believe to interpret the book of Revelation because if you don't, then it, all, then you, then it becomes an allegory and as we've said before, an allegory is open to anybody's interpretation. And if there's 25 adults in this room tonight, all 25 of us could have a different interpretation. Now, maybe two of us would agree, and then, well, we must be the only two right. The problem with an allegory is the person who is interpreting thinks that they are the only ones who are right. So the only way to really interpret the book of Revelation is to literally Take it for what it says. And I think if we do that, that we will uh, come to the, I, I, I'm convinced, the right conclusion on the matter. And so we're studying the seven churches. I said this now. How many remember? How many remember? How many sevens are there in the book of Revelation? Rich. How many? 54 sevens in the book of Revelation. So we must then take that the number seven has got some real significance to it. And again, if we look at the number seven, it, it is the number of completion. How many, time, how many days did God create the world in? Six, and on the seventh day he rested. How many times did they uh, uh, march around the ark, or march around, uh, how many days around, you know, the city? Jericho. Uh, they, they marched around it six times. On the seventh day, they, they marched around it seven times, a number of completion. How long was Noah in the ark before God shut the door? Seven days. Uh, how many parables of the kingdom are there in Matthew 13? Seven. And so the number seven is a number of completion in the New Testament. And so when we read about the seven churches and the time that the seven churches take up. And if the number seven is the number of completion, then when we get to the church at Laodicea, which is the seventh church, it must signal then the end of the church age because seven is the number of completion. Now again, if you don't take the Bible on a literal thing like that, well, then it can mean almost anything. So, the number seven is important in the book of Revelation. God is quite logical. The Bible says this in Isaiah 118. What is Isaiah? I know what it says. Anybody know what Isaiah 118 says? Yeah. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God's logical. That's what God is. God is not illogical. Now, his ways are past our ways, and, and uh, David said such thoughts are too high for me. But anyway, all right, we're back in verse 8 about the church at Smyrna. All right, so we have Ephesus, then we have Smyrna. The, the, again, the church of Smyrna was a little church, literal church, but again, we've said that the seven churches picture a time period during 
the church age. And the church of Smyrna pictures about 100 A.D. The church at Ephesus ran from the time of Christ until about 100 A.D. with the passing of the, of the last of the disciples, the apostles. The church at Smyrna began at about 100 A.D., the, the, the prophetic, as we look at the church age, and went to about 310, 316 A.D. That is the general time period assigned to the church at Smyrna. Now, again, I don't want to belabor it because we, we, we'll do this every week, but not only was the church at Smyrna a literal church, but it was also a picture of a uh, time period in the church age. It also pictures churches today. There are churches like Smyrna today, and it pictures different kinds of Christians. Now, under the angel, angel's messenger of the church in Smyrna, the church in Smyrna, now, we're not sure how the church started, but the Apostle Paul was through that area, so there, he could have easily gone there and it not really be written in the book of Acts. It's not really clear how the church got started, but suffice it to say there was a vibrant church in Smyrna. But it died. Passed away. To the dustbin of history which ought to be a lesson and, again, a warning to us. I don't know how long we have. Jesus may come. We pray even so come, Lord Jesus. Lord, help me to live today in such a way that if you do come, that it will be pleasing to you. But the church of Smyrna ceased to, to, to be. You know how many? No, you don't, because I don't. I've read the statistic. I, I find it's hard to believe. But it's like 1,400 churches close every month in America. Now, there are other churches that open, okay? But there are like 1,400 churches that close. They, they do these surveys. Barna does these surveys, and his surveys figure that 40% of people in America go to church, but the actual percentages, like 20% of people go to church in America, which means 80% don't go to church. So we wonder, we, we have no reason to wonder why America's in the shape that it's in. Now, of that 20% that go to church, I don't know what the percentage would be that actually go to a church that preaches and teaches the Bible. Because we know that there are a bunch of churches that don't believe the Bible to be true, that don't teach Jesus saves, that don't teach Jesus is coming again. And so the actual number of, and I'm not saying Baptist churches, let's just say churches that preach that Jesus saves, that that number of churches that actually preach Jesus saves, be they uh, uh, Assembly of God or Church of God or, or uh, uh, uh uh, Southern Methodist, Southern Methodist, they're somewhat, although they're, they're not. But anyway, uh, they, they're, they're Methodist preachers that still preach the gospel and, and, and free will, free will, free will uh, Southern Methodist churches, not the United Methodist, although there may be somebody there that does, I don't know. But to say the churches that preach salvation by faith in America it's probably pretty small. It's probably pretty small. And churches close every day. And the church at Smyrna did. Now why they, what happened to them? Nobody really, why, why, they, why they folded up? Nobody can answer that. Because this church, the church at Smyrna, and the sixth church, the church at Philadelphia. Now, I will back up and say this. Of the seven churches, five churches have a condemnation. For example, Ephesus left the first love. Of the seven churches, Christ condemns five of them for something that is wrong. Two churches, the church at Philadelphia and this church, the church at Smyrna, there is no condemnation. Let's read. And under the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things. 
saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of the, those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. And, and I believe that that is significant where it says that there shall not be hurt of the second death. Now let's look at this and what time we have tonight uh, about this church. All right, to the church of the angel, the messenger of the church, whoever the preacher may have been, some, some think that it was possibly addressed to Polycarp, who was a disciple of the apostle John himself. Now, 86 years after Polycarp's conversion, he was martyred in this town. He was taken to an amphitheater, to an arena, and was martyred there. The amphitheater survives, and his tomb survives to this day. But unto the angel saith the first, again, we have a description of Christ, who is the first and the last. Look back at chapter 1 for just a moment. In verse 17, possibly took it from there. He may have just repeated it. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And so we have the same description in here in verse 8 about the Lord Jesus Christ at this church of Smyrna. He said, I am the first, saith the first and the last, which was dead, which became dead and is alive, all right? So here is Christ, describes him, he was dead. I serve a risen Savior, and he's in the world today, and he is alive. He was dead. He was dead. It kind of shoots a hole in all these people theories that he, he merely passed out, or that he fainted. He said, I was dead, and then he says this, and I'm alive, and is alive. Again, that shoots a hole in the theory of those people that say, well, it's just merely a spiritual resurrection, that Christ himself did not really arise from the dead, but he merely spiritually arose from the dead and that we spiritually serve a risen Savior. That's not what verse 8 means. Verse 8 means this, that he was dead. He wasn't mostly dead, partly dead. He was altogether dead, and that, and that he is altogether dead alive. I mean, we celebrate Easter, and we think about Easter, and think about, think about that day at that tomb. Uh, I would say this. When those women went to that tomb, and when Peter and John ran to that tomb, I bet they were somewhat excited when they found out Jesus was alive. One of the problems with the church today is that Brother Curtis always said this, that the dry rot of the church is apathy. If I go to church, fine. If I don't go to church, well, that's okay too. Apathetic. Having no feeling, really. Ah, uh, apathetic. Having no feeling whatsoever. Well, if I go to church, fine. If I don't go to church, fine. One of the, th I believe, as you look at churches, is that people become apathetic I'll bet they weren't apathetic when Jesus showed himself up to them. I'll bet they were, and, and this is what the Bible says. The Pharisees said, these that have turned the world upside down have come down hither. They turned the world upside down. He was dead. He was dead. But he is now alive. Now this is what he said. Here's a commendation. Remember I said there's no condemnation about this church. Here he commends them. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty. They were not a rich church. They evidently did not have a lot of money. But notice what he says, but thou art rich. Brethren, we are rich tonight. 
We're not rich necessarily in, in the things of this world, but the Bible says this, that in the ages to come, he'll show forth in Ephesians chapter 2, he'll show forth the exceeding riches of his grace toward us. People say, you know, they think, what, what are we going to do in heaven? I don't know what we're necessarily going to do in heaven, but I'll guarantee you this, whatever it is, we're going to like it. We're going to, have, we're going to enjoy it. It's not going to be, oh boy, here we go again. It's going to be something that we truly, you think about in this life. What is it that you really, 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 really like? I mean, what is it that you like doing more than anything else in the world? Chocolate. Yeah, chocolate. Oh, boy. If I, somebody said, well, put your eye. I love, uh, I love the outdoors. How I many like being outdoors with the bugs? Yeah. Don't eat bananas. That attracts bugs to you. But anyway, and that's old wives' tale because they eat bananas all the time. They don't. But anyway, it's because I love being outside, preacher. And you can, you know, I love hunting. I love fishing. I love being a school teacher. I love this. I love that. Whatever it is that brings, you know, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I love studying the Bible. I was reading about Jesus sent that guy. Maybe you can remember this. What was the name of the pool that Jesus sent the blind man to to wash his eyes so that he might see? No? Siloam. Yeah, the pool of, in this way, the pool of Siloam. Siloam. The pool of Siloam is how this Jewish guy, it was the pool of Siloam. So I said, man, you know what? I want to find out about that. You know, they only recently found it in about 2006. Now, where it was, the steps that went down to it, and where the blind man was, and I love reading about that. I love reading all about the Bible. And, I, and I, you know, Jesus spit on, and made clay and put it on the man's eyes, and he said, go wash. And it was quite a little distance through Jerusalem to get to the pool. And he went over there and he washed. Somebody had to have taken him, went over there and washed, and bang. Whatever it is that you like to do, heaven will be all that and more. The Bible says in Psalm, uh, I'm sure it's Psalm 16, it says, in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forever." more. Think about that one for a while. Pleasure forevermore. Now, the church at Smyrna didn't have a lot. They were involved in a great deal of persecution. We think that, you know, sometimes we have it bad. People don't necessarily like what we say or or our message, but this church, not this one, but the church at Smyrna was actively being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Maybe they had to meet in secret. Maybe they could not meet openly. Maybe they didn't have a building. Jesus said, I know thy works. I, I know thy works. He commends them. And your tribulation, the trouble that you have, and thy poverty. But he said this, thou art rich. See, Jesus kind of throws that in there. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, inwardly, outwardly, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. John 8, 44, Jesus said to the Jews, the Pharisees, you're of your father the devil. Uh, and uh, he was a murderer from the beginning and a bull not the truth. For he is a liar and there is no truth in him. These people at the church of Smyrna, there were some illegitimate people coming in saying that we are Jewish, but they were not. They were of their father, the devil. They were liars. Now, verse 10 tells us, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Really suffer. I know that, I know it's because my friend Larry, 
Larry Fisher told me when he was in Pensacola down there that uh, guys from Ruckton School would go out and at stoplights and, uh, uh, you know, hand people tracks at stoplights and stop traffic, and then they'd get arrested, and they say, well, we're suffering for Jesus. That's not the kind of suffering they're talking about here. We're talking physical, physical abuse. It's one thing if somebody, well, I don't like you because you're a Christian, but that isn't what was happening here. These people were physically suffering, and this is what Jesus said, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Some got thrown in jail. But even worse than that, into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death. Not only were some thrown in prison, but many suffered martyrdom. Now it says there are ten days. Ten days, most people think that the ten years that Diocletian was the Roman emperor for ten years, that the church of Smyrna suffered horribly and people were thrown to lions, and people were burned at the stake. And see, he says, fear none of those things. And, and notice the last line in verse 11. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. All right, might we suffer in the first death? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus said, fear none of those things. That shall happen to you. Some are going to be cast into prison in tribulation, the bitterest of, of, of tribulation, of persecution, as I said, occurred when Diocletian was the emperor. Just bitter. Cast into prison, killing them for their faith in Christ. I'm sure you probably have heard me say this, and you probably have heard other people say this. To avoid that, all they would have to have said is that Caesar is God. They didn't care whether you believed it or not. All you had to do was say it. You go free. But they were faithful. Notice again, but be or be thou faithful unto death. Now, we'd like to think that we would. And if you listen to the Christian radio station I remind you again that there are multitudes of Christians around the world who are suffering for Christ tonight. We have been very fortunate in America. Be thou faithful. Be thou faithful. Now notice, and I will give thee a crown of life. A crown of life is for those who are faithful. What do we say about the church, all these churches? Eventually, they became unfaithful. Again, Luke chapter, it's either 17, 8 or 18, 7. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith in the earth? Brethren, that's what, that's what we want. When that, when that trumpet sounds, we want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'll give thee a crown of life. Then he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Now, this is significant because it says it seven times in these two chapters what the Spirit says unto the churches. Hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. At the end of chapter 3, it says it. And then it never says it again after the end of chapter 3. Why is that? Why is it? Because I believe the church is now gone. The church is Smyrna. No condemnation commendation, be thou faithful. What was it that was so, f I know thy works, and thy tribulation, and thy poverty, and thy persecution. I know what it is. What did it take for Jesus to notice them? Just that. It wasn't that they had a lot, or that they gave a lot. It's just that they were faithful in the matter of their work and of their poverty and of their tribulation and of their persecution. And here's what he says to them, and here's what he says to you and I. Be thou faithful unto death, 
whether by persecution or old age or Jesus comes. Be thou faithful and I will give thee the crown of life. You know what? We'll finish with this. You not, may not be a great singer. You, you may not have a lot of money to give. You may not be able to do a lot of things. But there is one thing you can do, and that's be faithful. Just be faithful, and I will give thee the crown of life. Father, we thank you again. Now, Lord, help us take heed to this church. Lord, we pray. There was no condemnation. They were commended. They were, they were given an exhortation to be overcomers. Even though they may have suffered physical death, the second death had no power over them. And Lord, how we thank you for that tonight. That the second death has no power. Death might have some power over us. But the second death has absolutely no power over us. And we're so thankful to that, that we're eternally saved. And we thank you for that tonight, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you've done everything that you could possibly do for men to be saved other than save them against their will. Lord, if a person chooses to go to hell, they chose to go there, Lord, in spite of the love of God. Lord, help us to be faithful, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.